So, Mr. Correa, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me welcome very warmly our distinguished panelists and participants to this conference. And the South Center as an intergovernmental organization is very pleased to organize this conference in partnership with the Policy Center for the New South, a very important think tank of Morocco, which is developing a new vision about the South. So we really welcome very much this cooperation and hope this will be just the, the starting point for further cooperation between our two organizations. The theme of this conference is of critical importance for the South. Um, developing countries need to mobilize domestic resources. This is not just in order to face the crisis that has been created by COVID-19. It is necessary to reach the sustainable development goals to have a long-term development perspective for, for developing countries. They need uh, these resources to uh, fight poverty, to create uh, the necessary infrastructure, to di di diversify the economies, to improve a health and education system, to strengthen the capacity to undertake uh, research and development, just to mention some of the objectives that uh, developing countries need to achieve. In order to, to reach these resources, which are generated locally, are of essence. So the assistance provided by, by developed countries, the official uh, assistance, uh, as we know, maybe help in some circumstances, but is not sufficient. The same for foreign direct investment. This investment may contribute to, uh, in particular, to develop some sectors, but this is not the solution for long-term development. So mobilizing the domestic resources is the key for the future of our countries and our people. In order to do this, uh, developing countries face uh, many problems. One of the major problems is that there is a, an unbalanced international tax system. And this will be discussed uh, in, in depth in, the, in this conference. This uh, tax system prevents uh, developing countries from uh, asserting their taxing rights sufficiently, in particular in the context of the digital economy. As we know, many companies are doing businesses in our countries, but they are not paying taxes. And then this situation needs to be changed. So the conference will address three main issues. The first one relates to the reform of international tax standards to raise revenues from multinational enterprises. And interestingly, the title itself of this, of this theme suggests that this should be made in a way in which it does promote and does not discourage economic activity. So this is very important. Uh, now in the context of the new agreement that has been uh, has been made in, in the OECD. Uh, as we know, uh, by now there are 136 jurisdictions which have uh, agreed on, on this uh, new deal um, because of Hungary, Estonia, and Ireland recently joined that. But as it was stated in, in a document produced by the South Center in July, this, uh, this proposed solution is not enough, it's not sufficient to address the needs of developing countries. So this, this will also be, uh, I suppose, one of the main issues to be discussed during, during this conference. So we need to find a better reform, a better solution in order to address the needs of developing countries. The second issue which has been proposed for this conference relates to the negative impact of tax havens. As we know, it has a very deleterious impact on developing countries. There is a need to increase international cooperation to address this issue. Again, the agreement that has been reached is not enough to solve this problem, uh, and therefore uh, other measures need to be taken at the international level in order to ensure that developing countries can address this uh, major problem. And the third theme, which also uh, comes back to the issue of the reform of the uh, international taxation system. So we hope that uh, our distinguished panelists and uh, also participants will contribute with their uh, knowledge and their ideas in order to uh, make proposals uh, to have a, a better a better international tax system, a, a fair system that will ensure that uh, the taxation rights of uh, developing countries are respected and fully implemented. So with this, let, let me welcome all of you again and, uh, and thank you for, for the Policy Center for organizing this conference with the South Center. We are very happy for that. 
And I look forward for a very productive conversation in, in the context of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Correa. De vous exprimer l'intérêt de notre centre également de renforcer notre partenariat et de mettre euh, l'accent, je dirais, sur l'opportunité de la collaboration conjointe euh, pour faire entendre notre voix à l'international, pour contribuer également et efficacement à forger le débat international. And rightly, to forge that international debate and fit in our perspective that really lies on our belonging to the southern uh, hemisphere and south and it is not trivial to have the word south in the title of our center and this is one of the main objectives of the policy center we want to showcase the values of a uh, expanded south and emancipated south and thank you very much for your kind words and we hope that this event will build on a future and long-standing cooperation so the choice of today's topic is not that trivial because it really addresses an extremely delicate and touchy and crucial question on which we would like to hear from the uh, uh, um, outstanding Southern think, think tank. So uh, personally, I'm not an expert in this matter, so I would not adventure and venture on this path. But what Dr. Correa just said, and we have to command the uh, joining of a large number of countries to this new deal, on the international taxation system under the umbrella of OECD. This is a new era in international cooperation on an issue that has always been a rivalry between countries. So this declaration aims at two main objectives. First, uh, tax equity. Uh, we know how uh, the issue of taxation obeys to and complies with the criterias of uh, domicile rather than on the issue of business activity. So this, the installation of this minimum taxation rates uh, is aiming to put an end to this uh, fiscal or tax uh, dumping. And this will encourage and help the countries to allocate further res resources domestic resources, namely. And there is another objective that really will ha be helped by this decision. This will allow countries to really focus on real development issues and competitivity and competitiveness issues instead of going through the dumping, uh, taxation, or the shortcuts. So attracting international foreign trade and investments does not obey uh, to purely taxation problems, but this is also a matter of human capital business environment. And this will have a greater role within decision makers. So without no further ado, I'd like to invite our first panelists, uh, uh, Mrs. Natalia Cruz, let me remember, uh, remind you that you're uh, representing Colombia within the OECD negotiations on taxation. So, Mrs. Natalia, the floor is yours. Gracias, Asís, y gracias a todas y todos por estar aquí. Voy a hablarles en inglés porque para esto me resulta más sencillo. Muchísimas gracias a South um, Think Tank, which is really very crucial um, at this stage. So I have uh, four big remarks that I would like to state um, regarding the um, questions that, that were introduced by Mr. Correa, um, which are, uh, first of all, that the international new regime that was announced um, on the 8th of October is definitely not stable. Um, it does not address the very main underlying distributional issues that were created by a very colonialistic bias towards the residence um, state. So this, this huge issue, I think, has not been resolved by amount A in Pillar 1, and it has been worsened by Pillar 2, which um, has attributed all taxing rights to the country of the ultimate parent entity, which is always um, a residence, a traditional residence country, very seldomly a developing country. 
um, given that this regime is not stable, it is very important to mobilize our resources, both um, as developing countries and as international organizations to make sure that this agreement is revised and soon so that this very um, important distributional issue is properly addressed. Um, that said, I think my, my second remark goes to, to note on the positive side of what happened. So we had 136 jurisdictions joining this agreement. And I think this is a very important step um, because nowadays multinational enterprises are certainly more powerful um, than many states. And if we try to go our own separate ways in regulating their activity, we will probably lose out, um, which is what has been happening so far. So joint action by all countries, I think, is absolutely necessary at this point to be able to address um, the activities of multinational enterprises. So um, the fact that we could come together, 136 countries, definitely speaks well of the future. We need to take joint action in the future, and the future tax reform has to be based on this cooperation. Um, a global problem has to be tackled um, in a global way. So this is this is also um, a very positive side of things. I also want to note that 136 countries were able to agree on a simpler way to tax. We were able to agree on a formula which was um, posted as, as a better way <laughs> to tax uh, multinationals because it's so much simpler to administer. Um, and everyone out there in the academia said that that was a utopia because we could never agree on the factors of the formula. And yet we agreed, you know, the 8th of October gave us a new light um, for using formulas and, and for believing in the fact that we can agree on difficult topics like this. Um, we also, I also wanted to note um, as a fourth remark, another positive aspect of the agreement, which has been the acknowledgement that the arm's length standard is simply not adequate um, in these days and times because of the high mobility of the supply factor um, elements. It is very easy for a multinational company to manipulate and choose where they want to locate every factor of the supply, whether it's intangibles, their factories, um, their employees. It's easy nowadays to choose where to put those. Um, so given that very, very high mobility, it is definitely important to see that the separate entity approach is just um, no longer working. So this acknowledgement is also, I think, positive news for the developing world. And I think we should root farther on um, to expand this single entity approach um, and to reduce the space that multinational entities have to choose where they pay taxes and how much taxes they pay. Um, as to the competitiveness that uh, both Aziz and Mr. Correa were mentioning, I think um, I have two important remarks. The first one has a lot to do with what Aziz was mentioning on the bigger dimension on how we compete for resources and investment. We definitely need to bring jobs and to bring money into our countries. But we are definitely not starting from the same start line in this race for um, capital and investment. I heard uh, Mr. Mike Williams who was a delegate of the UK in a conference very recently, and he was very proud and very happy saying that because now we have a minimum global tax, um, now the UK would be more competitive because they have skilled labor, the best infrastructure, free health, free education, and everyone would want to come to the UK to invest. And when I heard him say that, I felt <laughs> very frustrated because this is not the scenario for most of the world. We don't have great infrastructure. We don't have skilled workers, a, a large number of skilled workers. We don't have 
great free education or great free public health to attract these companies into our territories. So I think in the future, tax reform has to take into account these disadvantages and these differences in the starting point. So if we definitely, if we will be talking about competitiveness and they will be removing one of our uh, possibilities to compete, which is um, tax incentives, then they need to compensate for that. In, so that we can achieve some equality in infrastructure, skilled workers, um, investment climate, and all those other factors that Aziz was mentioning. Um, finally, um, on tax havens, I think that the best we can do right now is just uh, get the information. You know, there's nothing wrong with money being parked in tax havens as long as everybody knows who it belongs to, and. Um, the the automatic exchange of information has not been enough um, because it, it only discloses the owners of financial accounts but it is very very important to understand who are the owners of the entities behind those accounts so the ultimate beneficial owners of the entities must be uploaded into a global ubo registry and this is a very um, good use of international cooperation money help countries upload the information on ultimate beneficial ownerships of their domestic entities, help them uh, fund the systems needed to keep that information updated and help the world consolidate that information into a single database. Um, that's what I would propose as a first step um, regarding tax havens. So I think those are all my remarks. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Madam Natalia Cruz, for this nuance that you've provided and for this endorsement that seems to be a preliminary step, but there are a certain number of gaps that need to be uh, bridged uh, along the way. So this is extremely interesting. And the point that you mentioned on this uh, equality of chances or this uh, neutrality that will be taken, that will be, that will be introduced in the different levels of development and the starting point uh, for each country, in fact, to truly embody the idea, the principle of equity in and of itself, because the principle of equity goes well beyond equality from an accounting standpoint. So thank you very much. I'd like to rec remind our audience that you can uh, follow us online on YouTube or Facebook and share your questions with us. We are also uh, live on Twitter with some live tweets being shared. I now give the floor to Madame Keith, who is the commissioner within the Independent Commission for Taxation and Reform for Companies. So Madame Kim, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening to everyone. Sorry for not unmuting. Uh, I think I will not anymore discuss the effect or benefit or disadvantage of pillar one and pillar two because everyone in the tax global tax community are discussing it. And basically, ICRIP has also sent a letter. Uh, to the G20, putting forth our position that it is not really, it will not really benefit the developing country, but will develop will benefit more in the developed country, especially the the setting of choosing only 100 entity from which you will use the minimum tax rate and from which you will allocate. And most probably, it will all the allocated tax will all go to the developed country because these corporations are basically hosted in the developed country. Uh, what I want to discuss may sound radical, uh, because what I really believe is that to really solve the problem, we have to go to the very heart of the cause of the problem, and not just gloss over it and do a band-aid solution. At the, at the heart of things, what is par of paramount is important is how to help developing countries mobilize domestic revenues 
to be able to achieve the sustainable development goal that all nations, member nations of United Nations has agreed that each nation should strive for. Furthermore, as I will explain later, it is for the benefit of the multinational enterprise and developed country that developing countries and its people prosper. Why? If they're prosperous, they, their purchasing power will, will increase. And the increase in purchasing power of developing country and its people will directly benefit the multinationals because these are really their market. So if your customer has more money, they will buy more of your product and therefore you will have more revenue and you would have more income. So it is to my mind, to the benefit of multinationals and developed country that the developing country should be helped so that uh, they would have more wealth to be because they're the customer. I believe to do this, you have to rethink the whole tax system. The old tax system is really based on a theory that economic growth and activities are driven by capital and investment. However, today's economic growth is really driven not by capital or investment, but by consumption. In fact, one of the biggest economy in the world, China, has already changed the way they plan their economic policy, changing from being export oriented to being uh, for, to an economy that is dependent on domestic consumption. If you look at it, the thing that is driving economic growth globally is the exploitation of the market of the developing country. Since the developing country has a bigger population, uh, so this is the market that all MNEs and developed country are really targeting. And the economic growth is also uh, driven by exploitation of the natural resources of developing country. So if we look at it, the manner of taxation should be change to so that it will be you will tax it based on consumption rather than based on income uh, which is what our present system does not do because our present system is more concentrated on taxing income although there has been a shift toward this this thinking when we introduce the value added tax system globally the whole concept is really to move from taxing income to taxing consumption. So if we look at it, uh, if we say that growth is driven by consumption and exploitation of uh, natural resources, then the developing country should be given more voice on how these taxes should be imposed. But as it is today, it's not the developing country basically were never asked how what their problem is. Uh, base erosion and profit shifting is a general characterization of a problem faced by developing country. But the nitty gritty of base erosion and profit shifting as to the developing country was not the one that really was tackled in the OECD Global Forum for BEPS. Uh, the characterization of the problem, specific characterization, was given by developed country, and the solution uh, proposed were solution that developed country think will benefit them. So I believe that uh, developing country should exert their influence because they're the one driving economic growth globally now. And I think the, the other thing that we should have a rethink about is this, the, the basis of all the double taxation treaty. Because the basis of all the double taxation treaty is based on economic growth that are driven by capital and investment. Like I said, it's now economic growth is driven by consumption and exploitation of uh, natural resources. Hence, there should be a major rethink of what of the basis of all this double taxation treaty. Um, now, with regard to the problem of digital economy, I think it can be broken down into bits and pieces. And so that what will be left is the one that's really the problem. 
because if you say online e-commerce and your and the product is a physical goods there should really be no problem because the 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 target of the goods the, the jurisdiction can actually tax it when the goods come into their country because we impose duties and taxes on imported goods now if now the uh, the other component are soft product now these are licenses download the software downloading of uh, movies books and all those things now in that you will have to divide it again one is if it if the target is a business which would need to deduct it as an expense you can actually uh, put in a system where in if you do not issue a receipt that is registered in the jurisdiction then you cannot deduct it as an expense now if you don't deduct it as an expense in effect taxes will be paid the only difference is that who will pay the taxes it will probably be the business establishment in the in the country now the the only problematic side will be uh soft goods that are being downloaded uh, that targets the consumer you know, because they won't be able to deduct they don't need to deduct it as an, as an expense uh, however you can also break it down you know? uh, if you if something is to be paid by credit card or through the bank you can actually impose a tax on that and in effect imposing it on the goods itself what will be left is probably those that are paid for in cash but at least if it's paid for in cash, then the jurisdiction, the authority in the jurisdiction can have a way to follow it no? because it's the cash is just within the jurisdiction of the taxing authority. Uh, and I think I was also asked, why is it that the Philippines did not join the inclusive framework? Uh, the Philippines was invited to participate in the discussion and in and we agreed to participate provided that it, because we're not allowed to vote and we said that we will participate provided that we will not be bound by the by whatever agreement that was voted for in fact the Philippines was made the vice chair of working work program number action plan number 15 the last action plan that was created when everything was completed. Uh, but despite that, and having reviewed what was taken up and what was proposed, we decided not to join the inclusive framework because we do not see a benefit to us that is commensurate to the expense that we have to incur because we have to attend all this conference. And we have to pay for all our own travel of our people and and hotels right and secondly there are going to be membership uh, fees that are going to be charged and the other thing that we we thought about that why we did not join is we don't want to be stressed out that we are that things are being imposed on us that we have to comply when if we do not see any benefit to the country so that's basically the reason why we did not join the inclusive framework so that's my presentation thank you Thank you very much for this very interesting global perspective of uh, your approach. You have uh, tried to make a difference between the uh, uh, consumption system and the income system. So uh, it really is very interesting to uh, really highlight the new economic perspective. Thank you very much for your perspective, Philippine. Uh, your country has not uh, included or has not joined this initiative out of all the countries that have adhered, it would be good to have the perspective and opinion of another country that has not joined this initiative. It will be extremely interesting to listen to you and motives that really explain this choice. So very briefly, I will go now to Mr. Abdul, um, a senior program officer at the uh, tax uh, 
uh, Self Center Initiative. Uh, thank you very much. You have 10 minutes, Mr. Abdul, to share your comments with us. Thank you very much. You have the floor. Thank you very much for the uh, opportunity. It's my pleasure to be here to share the panel with such distinguished panelists. I'd like to begin by uh, building on what some of the previous panelists have mentioned. Uh, especially Ms. Kevin Henares, she had spoken about uh, the importance of consumption. And I think that is really one of the major victories which we have seen in the two pillar negotiation. Because we have seen that for the first time, demand has been accepted as a factor in allocating profits. If the OECD's transfer pricing guidelines are seen, then they allocate profits to, uh, to subsidiaries uh, entirely on a supply basis functions, assets, and risks, which was very disadvantageous to developing countries who are mostly importers of uh, goods and services. But now, under the two-pillar discussion, we have seen that for the first time, demand has been accepted as a principle of allocating profits, which is a big uh, victory for developing countries. Um, the, also, uh, Ms. Kim Henares had pointed about this aspect of registration uh, for VAT where the bill uh, should be locally generated in order to be ex uh, eligible for a tax deduction. Uh, this is one of the interesting discussions which is going on in the UN Tax Committee because under Article 5, the commentary on, on a permanent establishment, registration for a VAT or a GST uh, tends to uh, have, a, have an impact on the determination of a permanent establishment. But developed countries are actually trying to get this removed from the commentary in the UN uh, Model Tax Convention. And this is something which should be opposed. It should remain, especially as we see in the digitalized economy going forward, uh, the determination of a permanent establishment. I mean, we've seen in the two pillar discussion, nexus can already take place without a PE. And this is something which should be further promoted, this aspect. Um, now, coming to my own presentation, there were three uh, questions which were given. Uh, one was on how can international tax standards be uh, reformed so that developing countries can raise revenue from MEs without discouraging economic activity. So I want to focus on the aspect of taxing rights. So if you look at the way taxing rights are allocated, these are allocated in model conventions, either the UN model or the OECD model. And by and large, both of these models over allocate I repeat, over allocate taxing rights to developed countries or residence jurisdictions, which tend to be one and the same thing. So the fight which has been taking place in the UN model is to really change it so that taxing rights are reallocated more to source countries. So I want to give some examples of some of the issues which developing countries are fighting for right now in the UN model, because the OECD model can only be changed by the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, which is governed by OECD countries exclusively. So developing countries have no option to change anything in the OECD model. Therefore, the UN model is the only option available. So I want to give some examples. So one of the issues, for example, right now is the question of uh, computer software. If a payment is made for the use or the right to use computer software, then developing countries have been demanding for a long time that they should be taxable as royalties and not as business profits. Because if it's taxed as royalties, then essentially the source country can impose a withholding tax and that would make it much easier for them to collect the revenue because it, otherwise it would be taxable as business profits and because many very often these software sales are made without a physical presence in the source country it's very difficult to collect taxes from these uh, big software companies so uh, amending article 12 to include computer the use of computer software in the definition of royalties is one of the issues which developing countries are fighting for Another example is on capital gains. Capital gains are basically when an asset is sold, then the profit which you get is a capital gain. Now, very often, uh, big companies which carry out mergers or acquisitions, they do it through tax havens, and these are offshore. So these offshore uh, indirect transfers essentially give rise to capital gains, but uh, this creates a lot of revenue loss for developing countries. So amongst other things, one of the things developing countries are fighting for is that under the UN model right now, all of the residual rights of capital gains are given to the residence country. But this is quite illogical and it should be given to the source country. So the amendment of Article 13 to give all the residual rights of capital gains to developing countries is another issue. Then there's the issue of uh, income from shipping. 
income from air transport and shipping right now is taxable only in the country of residence. Very often we see that shipping companies, air transport companies are registered in tax havens and the profits which they generate are neither uh, taxed in these tax havens nor in the countries where they actually operate. So this is another issue which needs to be changed. Article 8 should be changed so that the income of these companies is taxable where they actually do business and generate profits. So these are some of the examples of how international standards can be reformed so that the taxing over allocation of taxing rights to developed countries comes to an end and the balance is restored with uh, the taxing right being given to the countries where the economic activity actually takes place. Uh, coming to the second uh, topic on the tax havens and the role of in international cooperation, pillar two, which has just been agreed upon, is of very little use for developing countries and thankfully it is optional. So most developing countries can and should actually ignore it because it really is not going to bring any benefit to them. The way the system works is that the headquarter jurisdiction can first decide to collect the undertaxed amount and if it doesn't want to do it, which is very unlikely, then and only then an intermediate jurisdiction uh, where the intermediate uh, entity is located can collect it. And if they refuse, then finally the source country, which is usually a developing country, can uh, has the right to collect this uh, tax. So uh, the way it is structured right now, Pillar 2 has very, very limited uh, benefits for developing countries. They are better off going with unilateral measures such as alternative minimum taxes or using anti-abuse rules such as a principal purpose test or limitation of benefits tests. These are much more helpful for them than Pillar 2. Uh, coming to uh, the third point on digitalization, this of course uh, goes back again to the two pillar discussion. In pillar one, we see that the amount of tax which is actually going to be collected is around $10 billion, which is a very small amount of money, especially when by the OECD estimates, this amount of tax avoidance is about between 100 to $240 billion and other estimates make it even higher. So we see that the main interests of developing countries um, have all been rejected. The 30% of residual profit has been rejected. The uh, reallocation of total global profit has been rejected. Most of the most of the demands of developing countries have been rejected. The structure is quite complicated. Amount B, which is going to simplify the uh, routine functions, has been pushed to the end of 2022. It's very important that Pillar 1, if it is implemented, should be implemented with Amount B and not without Amount B. This is something which developing countries should really press for. And um, uh, the, another aspect which is very important is that the multilateral convention are developed countries going to sign and ratify it? Because if they don't, then it doesn't matter if, if all the developing countries in the world ratify it, but the developed countries don't, then it doesn't matter because they are the ones who have to actually surrender the profit, have to surrender the taxing right. So uh, it's advisable for developing countries to actually wait and see whether developed countries are going to ratify the convention before they take any uh, important decisions in this regard. Until then, they can continue with unilateral measures or Article 12B of the UN Model Tax Convention. It's, an, uh, it's a much simpler alternative which they have. And um, until they actually sign the multilateral convention, they are under no legal obligation to even abide by the statement which they have uh, agreed to. It's a political statement. It's not a legally binding obligation. So developing countries should be very careful when they are signing the multilateral convention and giving up their um, tax policy space, actually. So um, on the last point, I would just like to say that, again, when it comes to Pillar 1, attention is needed to the revenue sourcing rules and the elimination of double taxation rules so that the revenue is sourced to the final consumer and developing countries can actually benefit. And when it comes to elimination of double taxation, the entity which is going to surrender the profit should come from developed countries and not from developing countries. So these are some thoughts on the uh, topics which have been given. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdul, for all these guiding principles that uh, really shows that the uh, path for equity is really very long. And this means that uh, developing countries really should they should they take on board their own destiny and really apply those principles that will be beneficial for them. Thank you very much indeed for your enlightenment, sir. I now go to Mr. Larbish Jaidi. He is a senior fellow for the Policy Center for the New South. You have the floor, Mr. Jaidi. Microphone. 
Microphone, please. We cannot hear Mr. Jaidi. He's not using his microphone. Mr. Jaidi, can you switch on your microphone, please? Okay, there you go. I'm I'm good. I'm all set. Thank you. Is it okay? Yeah, we can hear you, sir. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Aziz, uh, and thank you for bringing us together around this panel on an extremely important uh, topic that is uh, timely also and it really is, uh, pla is promising for the future. I will focus my uh, comments on a question and a point of view. And my question was if, uh, whether this agreement on international taxation that has just uh, been adopted, what are the next steps? And what, what about it? And what is the uh, perspective on the, the opinion of South uh, and developing countries on the new phases and the new steps? As we know, the 136 countries that uh, have negotiated these major reforms to fight against uh, tax evasion and all other major challenges have decided uh, uh, less than a week ago in a very critical meeting to go for a uh, an agreement, a deal, if I, that deal that has been hanging on for on the table for months and even for years. Of course, it's been very well prepared and uh, under the umbrella of OECD, uh, bringing together all developed uh, countries. It also got the support of many, many heads of states, states of the G7 in their previous meetings and encounters. But as we know, the path of the text was not that easy uh, river, as an easy river would flow. And that's a long way to a to Tipperary, and it's still a lot of challenges ahead because it contains a lot of measures that some uh, would think of as the revolutionary measures and very forward-looking and progressive to um, uh, plan and provide like 10% of taxation for multinational organizations. This means that uh, uh, no multinational could pay less wherever they are domiciled and it will uh, uh, make unuseful and totally obsolete those uh, bad practices of uh, you know tax havens etc it also plans and provides for the large groups uh, the digital leading groups should accept to be taxed where uh, the uh, their consumers and users are domiciled or are hosted and not where their headquarters are uh, located and that's another important step forward and they they want to avoid that big and leading companies like uh, google facebook etc uh, escape to uh, taxation because a lot has been said uh, about this over the last year so this is a major step that was really made towards the uh, setting up and implementation of a global taxation system on multinationals, but we're not there yet. This is not what the uh, uh, southern and developing countries were actually waiting for, and not even by 2023 in the framework of this uh, project. So the deal that was achieved uh, that really uh, took some struggle to OECD should be uh, still and yet um, um, validated by national parliaments and endorsed by national parliaments. So, uh, this uh, agreement or this deal will, act, of course, uh, uh, enforce uh, the 10-15% uh, of tax ratio level for all the multinationals uh, and also provides for that the large groups, uh, digital leading groups, should accept to be uh, taxed in those uh, countries where their users or consumers are located. They do not have the right to uh, tax uh, for, uh, well, uh, normally tax where uh, their headquarters are located beyond the 10%. 
we've seen and a lot of countries being reluctant over the last uh, weeks, but we have seen also the adoption of many countries, which really led to, for developed countries, namely EU countries, to adopt new uh, guidelines that will be published uh, very soon. So, and directives, EU directives. So what about the future of this new deal? Is this really a game that should be played at parliamentarian level, namely European uh, Parliament level, but also the game is being played and the stakes are in the United States. Uh, no, made no mistake because the Democratic, uh, uh, Democratic Party with John Biden's uh, have uh, given a political support in the aftermath to the project in the aftermath of his election. But then they'll have to go through Congress, which is not an easy task for uh, the uh, American executive uh, party. But however, the green light of um, American senators and parliamentarians is absolutely critical for the two pillars of the reform one and two, namely the one relating to the reattribution of the uh, taxation rights that will uh, be subject of an international or multilateral convention that should be in turn adopted and endorsed by parliamentarians of each of the uh, countries engaged in a process. Therefore, national parliaments still have their word uh, and they have a say on this and they will have to make a decision on this minimum uh, taxation uh, level, knowing that really the taxation uh, policy is decided at, at Parliament. In the United States, the faith of this process is, let's face it, uh, partly linked to the negotiations that will take place on the major uh, tax reform in the United States uh, engaged by President Biden, and that really hopefully uh, that aims at lifting and rising uh, uh, taxation uh, tax revenues on big companies, uh, hopefully having a positive impact on the social side. So this is a matter of uh, taxation reform and we should have a closer look on how the debates and discussions and our arguments within the um, American institutions will take place. This being said, this agreement uh, will mitigate and have, um, aiming to mitigate uh, tax ev ev evasion has been concluded, but other steps need to be crossed and they are very hard ones. Some of the previous speakers highlighted it. Some technical files and technical issues that need to be further clarified but are really significant and paramount in terms of implementation because the implementation phase is really, really important in this kind of process. So developed countries and emerging countries during the negotiations really focus on the rights to be taxed and that will be redistributed to consumers' countries. The United States wanted this share to be 20%. Emerging countries like Turkey, uh, Brazil, India wanted to 30%. And compromise was around 27%, but way beyond this compromise. The question is how to have those granular and fine information to really determine the distribution of these resources. Currently, we know that there are technical issues to be further clarified. There might be some political blockages and challenges in the steps ahead. Maybe there will be some very tiny, tiny details, a penny detail, and this will end up costing billions. So the issue of redistribution of the resources is really important and is still pending. And we'll see that each state will be fighting to uh, preserve, pr fighting hard to preserve part of their resources. Well, let's say it, the amount that will be mobilized by this fight against evasion 
is benefiting primarily to developed countries much more than developing countries but that's another story i will uh, dwell on it later on but this being said the process is still open take the example of europe there are european directives that should be published uh, soon they are in the process of being negotiated but uh, most uh, EU member states need to achieve unanimity. Uh, and this is absolutely a, a precondition, a prerequisite. Uh, and also the, issue, the question of calendar, of agenda, because new rules should be enforced as early as 2023. So this whole debate on negotiations and implementation modalities is absolutely critical and needs to be further monitored. This will give further credibility to decisions that were made so far. Now, in this overall debate, what is the role uh, uh, of uh, developing countries and what will be the impact on south southern countries? As we know, tax ev evasion in southern countries uh, have been as, uh, es estimated at up to 23 billion a year and multinationals that are uh, located in most developing countries and south countries uh, mainly in africa have been appointed as being the fundamental cause of these uh, tax evasions uh, and this evasion of uh, international uh, multinational networks we've been doing some work on this and uh, this really makes uh, africa lose huge resources and this is why the report uh, on uh, tax uh, justice uh, has been pinpointing the problem and this is, has been even more critical in this covid crisis and the uh, growth challenges where the reform of uh, uh, taxation in the southern countries is a uh, hot uh, topic as you know, this is a very delicate topic in the southern countries and very hard to implement. So bearing in mind all these elements, we know perfectly well that south countries or southern countries are not only concerned, but they actually are suffering uh, the hardships of this tax evasions. The data published by the OECD on uh, tax evasion and namely on the activities of multinationals are around 400 to uh, 420 billion dollars out of which uh, 240 come from or stem from uh, the uh, evasions of multinationals but the share of africa in this uh, tax evasions is fairly low compared uh, to uh, some tax evasions that uh, some Western and Northern countries are victim of. But if you compare it to the budget of these countries, even if Africa's um, share of tax evasion is low compared to uh, other countries in the North, United States of, and Europe, if you uh, benchmark it with the GDP ratio, it's still, and it is very significant. And we know that according to the reports uh, published by the OECD and other leading institutions in the matter, we know that uh, developed countries are the ones who are liable and responsible for these evasions because we know that uh, marketplaces and the stock exchanges, the big ones at least, are um, more located in the north than in the south. This being said, Africa has been one of the continents that has been leading, a leading figure of this reform through advocacy, but also through the fact that its financial situations and public finance really demanded a uh, clarification, a clarification of the uh, tax evasion by multinationals. So this uh, tax reform has been in the discourse of Africa and the African Union for years. But the question is whether these two pillars that were selected and decided for on this agreement is an opportunity 
of course it is an opportunity uh, for Africa because Africa is on board and is part and parcel of the process and they will benefit from a return of the resources, hopefully. But the other question and more important one is whether the package of the two pillars is really a means for Africa, at least a relevant and sufficient means for Africa to mitigate and to offset all the tax invasion that Africa is uh, liable to and suffering from. This is an important question because in addition to this uh, agreement, many uh, African institutions, the uh, African Union and African Commission is calling for Africa to really fight uh, this uh, uh, this challenge to really better negotiate, uh, negotiate their share in the distribution phase and be part and parcel in part two and part three of this agreement that are planned uh, in the implementation phase of this deal of last week. So there are a range of recommendations that stemming from the African Union that really should be heard and should be taken on board, not only on the issue of the information that should be much more cost cutting, transparent and fine to really understand the resources envelopes that are not accounted for, but also figure out what are the distribution mechanisms and thirdly, how this uh, first phase will lead uh, to a global and how to become part and parcel of this whole reform process and implementation of this reform process in the coming years, namely 2022 and 2023, which is the time horizon that is planned for this implementation phase. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening carefully. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jaidi, for this uh, enlightening uh, comments and for uh, really uh, focusing on those technical details uh, of this uh, very ambitious reform of the uh, global uh, and international taxation, because if it doesn't result in anything, Plan B uh, is also interesting to hear. And it's uh, thank you very much for uh, the link that you have made between the international taxation and its benefits and the very importance that Africa is in, um, fully uh, engaged in the process. Now we're moving towards the Q&A session. So we have one of the questions that has just come in from one. So this question is for all of our speakers. If they could. Uh, maybe tackle it. We have one to two minutes to answer. I believe that the digital uh, question or issue is uh, fundamental in this debate. In fact, it was even discussed uh, by the countries of the South uh, and Africa as well, to the extent that uh, one of the mechanisms uh, for tax evasion is also the use of uh, digital technology to uh, to uh, evade uh, the accounting uh, I mean, accounting recordings and whatnot but now that uh, teleworking is will be more and more prevalent well we can locate the activity wherever it is performed from a from a remote working perspective and i'm sure that this should be able to lead us to not only reflect on digital as a means for traceability but also to avoid for this to be a means of relocating activities outside of the countries where the physical activity is actually being performed in my opinion this is one of the uh, one of the aspects which concerns digitalization 
something if possible um, on on the digitalization and it draws a little bit um, from what Abdul said before on how developing countries need to push to move away from physical presence as a factor to be able to tax uh, multinationals you know the digitalization in general and having more intangible assets only makes it more difficult <laughs> for developing countries to establish a nexus um, with a multinational company. Ms. Kim um, Jacinto Genal has also talked about um, moving towards destination-based taxation and towards a system that will privilege uh, consumption over just income generation. And I think this is um, a, a reasonable direction um, nowadays, taking into account what digitalization is doing, and not just digitalization, you know, being able to also from space, from from satellites out there, also make it very difficult for developing countries to tax source countries. So um, moving away from physical presence as a factor, and maybe thinking more destination-based taxation um, seem like very plausible now going forward. If Ms. Kim has any comments, I'll wait for her. Otherwise, I would like to say something. Yeah, uh, actually, I said uh, in my earlier presentation, I was saying that most probably the way to tax it is to tax it based on the payment side of it. Uh, because normally the payment side is the one that you get, you will be able to monitor uh, the payment, the income. No? So from when you make the payment, that should be where the withholding tax should be imposed or where the percentage tax or value added tax should be imposed. So it's one way of being able to capture the revenues from the digital economy. That was my proposal in my earlier talk. Um, we've discussed the, what solution the OECD has to give. I wanted to give two other, alter, three other alternative solutions countries can think about. One is Article 12B of the UN Model Tax Convention. It provides countries with two options. One is a gross basis withholding tax on each payment for an automated digital service. And the second option is a net basis tax where they give a simple formula through which the net profits can be calculated. This has to be included into the bilateral tax treaty with uh, whichever country um, the taxpayer is based in, uh, the non-resident is based in. That's one option. Two other options. One is the equalization levy, which has been implemented by India. The equalization levy is again a gross basis tax on payments for online advertisements and this has already brought in a lot of money for India. And other option is the significant economic presence law which has been brought in by Nigeria, where they basically said that even if the company is not physically there, they will still have to pay taxes and a withholding tax is levied on payments. So these are three alternative options countries can look at to actually collect money from the digitalized economy. very much for these contributions uh, so second question so which is a moroccan question i'm addressing uh, mr Haiti. so this the question says wh whether the tax reform which was uh, driven by the european union which mainly concerns the offshore zones and while they're wondering what is its impact on the attractiveness of the country generally speaking and so here maybe to uh, have our to bring in our panelists morocco was uh, categorized by the european union as a tax haven it was on the gray list due to the taxation system that was adopted and which concerns the offshore zones and a financial hub which was set up in casablanca as such, Morocco for a certain time was on this uh, gray list and so Morocco had to uh, undertake to remove all of the uh, tax uh, incentives to align itself with the European with the European uh, requirements. So so I wanted to ask you, Mr. Jaidi, what your opinion is on the country's attractiveness? 
I think that uh, during this negotiation with the European Union, especially this uh, pressure from the European Union for the uh, tax uh, framework of the activities, especially the t for these uh, activities to align themselves with the um, uh, the European tax uh, tax framework uh, and uh, in fact Morocco had a strategic option which is a lot broader a broader strategic option and to be a partner with Europe uh, for for trade and in, in services uh, and so the uh, question that was formulated by Europe, well, this this is something that came up first of all to see why my Morocco had to align with the European taxation system. And so whether whether Europe had become through this uh, regulation of offshore zones and, uh, for example, Casablanca Finance City, uh, whether it had become uh, very important it was it was a way to attract international capital in the same vein as Luxembourg or Liechtenstein or Bermuda. And I believe that if we take into account since I mean, since the birth of Casablanca Finance City, the number of companies that were established there, the the revenues of these companies that were established there. Well, I think this would be well below other offshore zones in even in Europe. But in this discussion, while well, it was considered that these offshore European offshore zones, whether in Luxembourg or elsewhere, well, let's say that they met what we what we like to call the minimum taxation base as it was defined in the European Union's legislation, whereas Morocco has opted for a a completely tax-free regime, which uh, left uh, some doubt on the attractiveness uh, or this zero taxation scheme. And so all of the activities that were related to the uh, mobilization of the resources and the re and reinjecting these resources and to in, in, to encourage these investors to to create jobs and whatnot. So since this uh, debate, Morocco has committed because in fact this is part of its uh, strategic uh, choice. It was a strategic choice for Morocco to reduce or rather to align the taxation base of uh, companies of companies that are established in this uh, uh, financial offshore zone at this minimum threshold, which was uh, which is in force in the European Union in order to preserve the other dimensions of its economic and trade relationship with Europe. So this is a first point. The second point is that uh, with, is this progressive or gradual alignment I mean, in the uh, time span that should cover all the way up to 2023? Well, can we say that uh, by re up increasing this uh, minimum tax of, of the companies that are established in this uh, financial zone, will this uh, hamper the attractiveness? Well, I think that there is a trend, that there's an international trend um, of heading towards a minimum taxation uh, base. And so I think that the tax co competition, quote unquote, between the different financial centers is becoming um, much less related to the taxation aspect. It is rather related to the economic environment. It is related to it is related to the reallocation of the mobilized resources. And it is also related to the whole uh, the whole framework and mechanism available to support regional national regional developments and so with regards to the relationship of low of having this minimum taxation and lowering the attractiveness of these financial centers well leads me to say that morocco was right in adopting such a choice of revising its taxation and to and to avoid staying in a in this to avoid having this uh, this label of uh, of avoid possibly keeping this label of being a tax evasion hub or even possibly uh, money laundering thank you very much mr jaidi 
maybe uh, time is running, but uh, maybe a last question that I would like to ask to my our outstanding panelists. One of our uh, listeners and participants is actually asking whether these reforms will be beneficial to b developing countries uh, and whether this international reform will not uh, challenge the principle of sovereignty of countries, uh, knowing that we are in a, pol a very um, tough uh, sovereignty uh, system and political uh, where sovereignty is really at the heart of the concerns of countries. I would say the contrary, this measure can help the sovereignty rather because this project allows uh, avoiding uh, tax evasions and uh, resources control and a way for the public powers to to really uh, better control and manage uh, the uh, international uh, multinational uh, companies working in the countries and better allocate the resources domestic resources uh, for um, growth uh, and development. So I don't see how this uh, international reform would challenge sovereignty. I would see it the other way around. I would uh, see it uh, rather a uh, an opportunity to sovereign, uh, to have sovereignty on those non-controlled resources for domestic sake. Now, of course, there is a harmonization and standardization of the uh, uh, tax policy around the world, the issue of uh, tax competitiveness that is competitiveness that is still a challenge. This is uh, uh, at the very heart of the concern um, to reach further harmonization. I think our uh, speaker or rather interlocutor was saying that the fact of joining this international reform will maybe bring limit uh, the uh, scope for these countries uh, to use uh, taxation as a, uh, a driver for growth. And the fact of uh, complying with international standards will leave very little room for the countries uh, to uh, play on the uh, tax policy and achieve development objectives. But, but this is also a problem. Uh, of taxation for multinationals. Uh, we can't uh, do a tailor-made taxation on multinationals. On the contrary, I think if this is uh, for multinationals, the deal has contributed to this consultation process and solidarity process to at least establish a minimum threshold of solidarity between countries on the taxation of leading firms and multinationals, otherwise, what would have been the capacity of southern country, of a small size country, to have a voice and impose their voice on those multinationals and impose a tax regime if it wasn't for this international forum? There are fields where the collective action is much more effective in reaching and achieving results than the principle of sovereignty. This is a superficial principle because we can't really implement it and enforce it. Mrs. Abdul, Mrs. Natalia, uh, Mrs. Kim, uh, and Mr. Abdul, have you have, uh, do you have any other comments? Yeah, uh, can I make a comment about the sovereignty issue? I think the sovereignty issue comes up because of the double taxation treaty you know at the i i think the basic rule is that a part of the characteristic of a country is the right to eat the power of taxation within its territorial jurisdiction and they have the power as a nation to tax people property or object and transaction within their territorial boundary uh, and I think it's also the sovereign power of the country to be the only one, because they're the one who can tax. They're the only one who can say what they will not tax. And all this difficulty arose because of all this double taxation treaty. And why did we have this double taxation treaty? Because the developed country is, was protecting their multinational enterprise. And then they were negotiating with the developing country to make sure that their multinationals enterprise, their constituent, will not be taxed 
in that developing country. So I think uh, this issue of sovereignty is a very important issue. And it is also something that will arise with regard to mandatory arbitra arbitration with regard to taxation, especially if we have the pillar one where you will have to allocate uh, income, right? So because first you will have to agree who the 100 con uh, corporation will be and you will have to agree also the characterization of the income on how you will apportion. So uh, one of the objections of um, a mandatory arbitration for taxation is precisely the sovereign right of the nation to say what is taxable and what is not taxable. So I think sovereignty is an important issue that should be addressed. And it is not something that the developing country can just surrender. That is my point of view, which may not, which others may not agree upon. Um, yeah. Mrs. Natalia, do you have any other comments? what um, Ms. Kim has just expressed, um, because we, we can no longer say as developing countries that we are still sovereign <laughs> to decide what we tax and what we don't tax. As you said, since we started signing double taxation agreements and since we started joining these uh, discussion groups and this general international tax architecture, we've already surrendered um a lot of of this sovereignty um so so i think at this point we don't really have that much um sovereignty also because um developed countries have started since the previous <laughs> century to stretch their arm <laughs> to tax the things that we don't tax for example with um controlled foreign corporations legislation um, so we, we cannot think ourselves as isolated in the world. Um, we, we definitely have to think of a world where a single ME has operations in more than 180 countries. Um, and our country is just one of those, um, you know, a, a small foot for a, for a very big creature. Um, so I think um, I tend to agree more with uh, Monsieur Jedi in saying that we really need to come together um, as countries to be able to really get the maximum benefit from the activities that MEs are performing globally. If we keep trying to do this on our own, I think we will keep encountering um, the world that we've been finding <laughs> lately, which is that MEs um, can profit from the differences in the positions that we take as sovereign states. So if there is any slight difference in our position, for example, the Colombian position on how to tax a specific item of income as related to the Moroccan position, then the multinational will be able to use that mismatch in its own favor. So I think um, it's high time that we recognize that, that it is really very difficult to address the issue of globalization and, and economic activity by the MEs uh, single-handedly. I think we need to cooperate. I don't think that the agreement um, in October 8th reflects um, <laughs> a, a positive cooperation um, in terms of development. I don't think that development was taken into account sufficiently. I think it's neo-colonialistic in many of its aspects, but I do think that we need to act together. So um, my, my bet would be rather than act single-handedly, just come together as developed countries so that we can be stronger and really create a voice to review this agreement and, and find something more sustainable into the future. Thank you, Aziz. Thank you, Aziz. I had a few comments of my own to make as well. One is that when it comes to, uh, I agree with all of the uh, speakers on the point of uh, multilateral cooperation is essential to this. 
um, whenever a country enters into a tax treaty and it gives up the right to tax an item of income, it is surrendering an aspect of tax sovereignty. So this is nothing new. The pillar one and pillar two discussions are also an extension of this basic principle. Now, uh, countries still have sovereignty. I must repeat that they are free to choose which solution they think is the best solution for taxing the digital economy. They are free to continue with unilateral measures. They are free to continue with Article 12b, or they are free to choose pillar one. And this is something which they should exercise very carefully because once they do uh, agree to any one of these options, then they are giving up something and they should be very clear about what they're giving up and what they're getting in exchange. The second point was on uh, mandatory arbitration, which uh, Kim Hanaris had raised. It's very important that the dispute settlement system to the extent possible in pillar one involve tax officials and does not become like international arbitral tribunals like we see in the investment world because if it becomes like that it will be an exploitative opaque and expensive system for developing countries so the dispute settlement system should involve tax officials and should be like the map process so these are two points i had on that uh, question thank you I now give the floor to Alibi Shaiti, who will be uh, sharing the closing remarks of this session. Mr. Shaiti, could you please turn on your microphone? Could you please unmute yourself? Thank you. This was a a major highlight for us uh, at the policy center to uh, be able to discuss uh, amongst such a high level and distinguished panel uh, to discuss international taxation which is uh, such a topical theme today and which will remain so for the next coming months uh, i would like to uh, express the regrets of our chair mr karim Ainawi, who was unfortunately unable to be here with us uh, due to uh, because he he was uh, called for uh, uh, an urgent matters um, as part of his functions so what's important to note and following this uh, meeting between the two think tanks we have a government uh, think tank and a national think tank uh, a moroccan think tank uh, well, however which uh, shares the same concern uh, which also focuses on the same research themes uh, and the interest for public policy and uh, reflection on globalization and its uh, uh, impact on uh, economic policies in general, but also beyond all of these issues relating to taxation and uh, globalization, there are other themes uh, uh, that also involve international cooperation, economic justice, uh, territorial justice, which are extremely fertile and that uh, allow us to consider engaging in other um, research themes and other areas uh, of collaboration. I mean, webinars are always an excellent platform today to, uh, to um, raise our voice, yours and ours, uh, as uh, to advocate uh, in uh, for themes and issues that are uh, dear to uh, all of our hearts. And I think that we can truly consider other, uh, other forms of collaboration uh, that uh, could be mutual, that could be mutually either publications that would mutual publications or mutual vis visits or possibly in the future organizing a uh, direct uh, contact or hopefully uh, in-person conferences uh, to get, that we could be organized together and that would allow us to um, to experience uh, uh, and to discuss our all of our common concerns uh, uh, truly together and so this was a first uh, and we're delighted for, from this first experience we'd like to warmly thank you we'd like to war warmly thank the south center for this uh, excellent initiative and we are reaching out to you just as you've reached out to us uh, to work together on issues of common concern of public concern 
that uh, that uh, transgress uh, our borders and which address the major global issues of how we can push forward together in the framework of a rigorous and uh, a deep analysis and also how we can uh, broadcast uh, our work throughout the world and also uh, attract other stakeholders and uh, institutions to engage in a, in a wider uh, consultation because it, obviously the 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 more we are well the the more the more we can broaden the reflection and this can be a great source of inspiration for decision makers so thank you very much thank you for this high level distinguished panel and we look forward to seeing you all very soon to discuss other themes of mutual concern. Thank you. And it's a